صباح الخير نرحب نرحب بكم those of you that come to these sessions regularly what we try to do is pack as much important discussion into as short a time as possible we take issues and matters of great importance and we get some of the you know the best people in the congress center and we try to drill down as quickly as possible they're very brief in terms of time they're 30 minutes we have a lot of ground to cover i encourage as much dynamism amongst you all for a, for a friday morning as possible we also have an audience watching us live online uh, and via facebook live as well so we'll have questions coming in from here we're a true meritocracy here at the world Academy forum so if you want your question answered stick your hand up quickly because you're competing with several million people out there in the great wide world. Um, this session is possibly one of the most important ones and, 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 and something we're you know, all passionate, um, passionate about trying to develop further is in terms of our knowledge. Tolerance at the tipping point. Globalization and multiculturalism used to be regarded as two sides of the same coin. But are we witnessing a growing backlash against minorities, migrants and refugees? And has humanity reached a peak um, tolerance? Now, I mention this because we had a series of articles and essays on our own website earlier in the year discussing this and it was such a, it was it was um, recognized and, and accepted with such a you know, huge degree of interaction engagement from our audience that we felt we really had to discuss this in more detail with some you know some really leading thinkers in the subject here in Davos that's my talking out of the way and I'm going to hand over to my panel I'm going to ask them a brief question each and then we'll hopefully get into the question and answer round. Um, Brendan, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Brendan Cox, you're the director of More In Common. You've been an activist in looking into um, issues around intolerance and, and, and opposition to hatred and, and, and populism for several years now. Are we at peak tolerance or have we reached it already? I, th I think what, what we're definitely witnessing and I think what's apparent is there is a, uh, a backlash. I think that backlash is being fed by uh, a range of factors. I don't think there's any one uh, individual factor uh, which is causing all of this, but I think there is a sense, uh, talking mainly about Europe and North America, um, but there is a sense of insecurity, and that's partly physical insecurity, um, uh, it's partly economic insecurity, it's partly um, uh, cultural insecurity. And I think those are combining at a very, um, at a, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, worrying manner which means that people who previously uh, may have, when you sort of dug in uh, to, to a level of detail, had concerns about diversity, concerns about other groups, those concerns are coming much to the fore, so we're activating uh, that group of people. And I think the question is, is can we deactivate that instinct? Can we um, maintain that um, central view of open and tolerant societies my, my, my view is that we absolutely can, uh, but we will only do that if we can bring together the, uh, the forces um, that are already on the side of, of liberalism and uh, diversity. Currently, they're very fractured. And secondly, if we get much better at speaking to and engaging with people who have those insecurities, we can't dismiss them. They are real, they are felt, and we need to engage in, them in, in a way that responds to those concerns um, that reassures people about the societies in which they live. But also, I think one of the critical things, we need to get much better at celebrating uh, what binds us together rather than just talking about what divides us. Why, is the, why are we losing? Why is this backlash happening in the first place? So as I say, I think it is that range of factors. I think there, are, there is this sort of, uh, it's the economics, it's the sort of uh, cultural um, uh, threat that people feel. Um, but, but I, think it's, I think we also be, need to be careful not to, to get too depressed in terms of, uh, you know, I don't think we have lost this. I don't think um, uh, we're at a stage where the centre of society in most European countries still generally is not in the, uh, the camp of extremism or hatred. Uh, people remain um, committed and supportive of communities with diversity in them. But, as I say, what we, what we, I think, have been very bad at is we spend a lot of time celebrating diversity, not enough talking about what binds us together. And what that's meant is that we've ceded patriotism, which is a very powerful instinct in people's identity. We've ceded that to the extremes, and I think there's a big opportunity for us now to take that back, to define patriotism in an inclusive way rather than an exclusive way. And I'd, I'd love to know some of the tactics you, you intend to employ, and we'll come to that later for sure. Um, Senator Ratna Omidvar, 
you're a Canadian um, national, you've been in government um, for a while, you've just passed um, a bill through Parliament. And what are the greatest um, challenges you encountered in doing that, in that process? Well, I, I think people think Canada has no challenges in this, uh, in this uh, conversation, and that's not entirely true. But I want to start off by talking a little bit about the, word, the use of the word tolerance in this context. So in my lexicon, and to a large extent in the Canadian lexicon, tolerance is a word of yesterday. Tolerance means to endure with, to put up with, as, to, as opposed to engaging with and being curious about other people. And I think we've moved in Canada from a post to be a post-tolerant society, and our challenge is now inclusion. Um, so having said that, uh, I will admit that there are societies and uh, jurisdictions that are, that are not there yet, and maybe it is a trajectory and a narrative that builds over time. Um, and, and certainly in Canada too, uh, we are seeing sort of louder forces, I would say, not as loud as those in the United States, but a, social certain, a certain social license seems to have been granted uh, to talk about things a certain way, to, to express racist statements and misogynist statements, and that too finds itself into our discourse. And, but I'm, I want to get back to uh, the question of has tolerance reached its tipping point? I think human beings are have, have the DNA of compassion and empathy and love. And if we say we've reached our tipping point on tolerance, I think we're putting limitations around humanity. So I can't accept that. I do accept uh, that we have to do better. And I think one of uh, our mistakes, you know, the big global hour mistake, is that we have been prone to a certain kind of political correctness, a certain kind of baffle gap, and we do a lot of telling and we don't do enough showing. So I'm talk, I would like all of us who are in this discussion to show, not tell. Show the evidence, show the success, show when uh, diversity results in shared prosperity, as it has in Canada. Uh, the wonderful work, uh, the data visualization work at the World Congress Center you know, about how people are moving and where they're going. Those, there's lots and lots of evidence from the United States, from Great Britain, from the Nordic countries, from Canada, that every euro invested in a refugee multiplies itself many times over five years beyond. There's a lot of evidence that more than 50% of the entrepreneurial uh, efforts in the United States come from immigrants and so on and so forth. Uh, but we seem to have rested more on the aspirational benefits of diversity as opposed to the real tangible benefits. So I'm just reminded of a session we had on Tuesday, I believe it was, the, the days do blur, but it was on forecasting failures, and we we're trying to explore <laughs> the difficulty experts have in, in, in predicting, so we talked about economics, but also in terms of trying to understand from a psychological perspective, and I believe it was Molly Crockett from Oxford University was talking about the um, the difficulty of the bias that forecasters have when it comes to economic self-interest rather than uh, the, the most powerful emotional drivers. And, and I'm just wondering, maybe there's more of a comment, that all this evidence-based um, statistics on the benefits of migration sometimes doesn't work and it's not hitting home at the moment. Well, I think you have to complement that with, uh, you know, connecting the heart and the mind. Uh, I think issues of national identity are incredibly important. I think a certain amount of social engineering is required. I read a blog uh, on the World Economic uh, Forum, which spoke to me by Nairi Woods. And the easiest part, uh, the easiest way of helping people understand each other is to learn another language. Now, if all of us in schools, in colleges, started to learn another language, another language opens up a whole different world. So I, I, I would say there are things we can do, but it is, it is making that connection uh, between the heart and the mind, and we often miss that. And it's fantastic having you here as somebody who has helped push through this, this citizenship bill. I want to move now to our third panelist, who's also um, created um, a huge amount of progress in, in his part of the world. Sheikh Abdullah Baya, you're the president of the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies. And I have here the Marrakesh Declaration, which is the 
on the rights of religious minorities in predominantly Muslim majority communities. And my question to you, sir, is how um, difficult was, was this process and, and, and what is it achieving now, now that it's, now that it's in operation? Thank you uh, to the moderator and also to the, my fellow participants and the audience. The difficulty always in, in this life and the challenges, they're always there. Uh, several years ago, we thought that the value of tolerance was something firmly rooted in people. And thought that it was really uh, axiomatic and an accepted principle, especially in America. E even in the, in the Islamic world to a large degree, but in these last years, we've seen humanity really um, falling back and, and seeing them just uh, regressing in these values that had been uh, beginning to practice because they're absolutely necessary. There has to be a, uh, a really a select group of people that think deeply about these things, both in the Muslim world and in the rest of the world, in America and Europe. They have to really think about the benefit of these virtues and because these are the most important uh, virtues for human society. If you have a society, you have to have uh, t the toleration of others. Without toleration of others, uh, wars are the result. Uh, s s sometimes uh, tolerance can lead to a recognition of the other, recognition of the other, it's it's a higher it's it's a higher virtue. The Quran says we made you nations and peoples in order to know one another. So this idea of knowing each other, of engaging the other, this is a mutual thing. Each one engages the other. Tolerance is it's something that you you ex you bear the other, but this idea of acknowledging and recognizing the other. It's, it's, it's something higher. Because you have to know the other. And if you know the other, then you'll see that he's equal to you as a human being. And then these, these difficulties begin to dissipate. When, when we saw a lot of these protests and the Arab Spring, uh, in, in uh, 2011, we, I got together a group of scholars to really think deeply about this problem of conviviality in the Muslim world because we saw this problem with the minority, minorities that they, they weren't with uh, because they weren't part of the majority of the religious community of Muslims. They, be, they, they were persecuted, and so we wanted to think, how can we treat this? But we needed to do it from within the religion itself, because the problem was a misunderstanding of the religion. So we looked, how could we do this from within the religion itself? So we began to study this deeply, and I got a group of scholars together to do this. And in the end, we, what we came to the conclusion that the, this idea of equal citizenship this also the social contract, this, this contractual citizenship, that this is the most appropriate way to uh, work in the time that we're living in. And we have, from 1400 years ago, a, a uh, covenant from the prophet that, uh, that actually established equality of the different religions in the city of Medina. And, and so we brought Christians, we brought Jews, we brought Yazidis, we brought Hindus, we brought uh, all of these different groups came and, 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 and so we brought them together to really present this covenant and it's similar to Helsinki's uh, declaration. And so this took a lot of time, we really worked hard on it 
and we had to first convince the others that this is actually sound and it's from the matrix of our own religion and, and it's appropriate for this time. And, and th it's a very high level of tolerance. It's not the low level of tolerance. It's not the indifference of difference where, where you don't think about just going against the other, but it's looking at the other as equal to you. And he does, uh, the other person doesn't need to be acknowledged by you because God created him equal to you already, but you have to acknowledge that. So this is what we did, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, equal citizenship, social contract, contractual citizenship. Is tolerance universal and uniform across the world, or are there regional um, differences that we need to bear in mind? You talked about the trajectory, Senator. Where do you view that trajectory going, and how much gap is there between societies around the world? I think the gaps are significant um, in different parts of the world for different reasons. Uh, societies where education, I think, is more generally available, the gaps may well be closer. But I think I want, I want to make the point that there is no end to this journey. Uh, because the minute you think you've arrived at nirvana, uh, you're actually in a box. Uh, and uh, tolerance, if I may, use that, the word, uh, continues to reinvent itself because, uh, so for instance, in Canada, uh, 20 years ago, we never talked about the rights of transgendered people. We now have legislation before our, house, uh, before our houses of parliament and the Senate in Canada that will deal with the rights of transgendered people. So I think it continues to reinvent itself and the core lessons uh, are openness, and, um, and engagement and curiosity about, n about each other as opposed to passive uh, acceptance of existence. Quick, let's see if I see who has questions. I have one from, uh, from Facebook from um, Irfan Ali. Every, why did capitalism fail to end poverty? Slightly off, slightly off subject. Any views on that running capitalism and economic growth and living standards? in terms of tolerance. Maybe we'll leave I mean, that one. Uh, if you want to have a go that one. I'm not an uh, expert in capitalism. But if we say capitalism, if we talk about humanity as opposed to capitalism, it's not capitalism or Marxism, but rather justice, social justice. If, if, we, if we talk about justice, then we won't fail. But if we just talk about capitalism, there's always going to be losers by its nature. It's just by the nature of the system. Uh, Adam Smith even recognizes this, that, that people benefit from others and, and there's going to be losers by a zero-sum game. So there's, there, this is my opinion. There's, so I, I apologize. But uh, I just want to say, that, so if we look at the difference between Smith and Kant, for instance, then you'll, you'll see that Kant was more concerned with social justice. Uh, but um, there is, even though there is more prosperity in societies, there's also greater in inequality. And we know that when societies are unequal, they are less tolerant of each other. So I think A does equal B, and economic prosperity that is shared by all, that's not in the hands of a certain elite, whichever way you describe it. Um, but is spread across through either tax redistributive measures or legislation, that is where you create a, 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 a sort of a foundation for equality and justice and tolerance. So we have to be careful here but for, for, to not cast Canada as a complete nirvana because you have a tendency to um, 
laud and, and like a lot of the a lot of the policies that Canada has right now. Um, but you, we're talking about tolerance and openness and, and inclusion in Canada being fairly well advanced compared to other countries, including across across your border. In fact, is it is it economic inclusion? Is that the key, or are there any other factors? I think it goes to something much more amorphous and intangible, and that is identity. Brendan talked about patriotism as a key part of a national identity. Uh, Canada uh, is a new country. We are protected uh, because we're on top of the world. We share a border, the, the, the safest, securest border with a very wealthy country. So we have to have, we've, we've, we've found ways of defining ourselves differently. Multiculturalism is one of our symbols. It ranks up there with maple syrup and the RCMP, and this is important, there's no proof, but when Canadians feel proud of themselves and they stand up tall, it's normally long uh, a vision of Canada being multicultural, open, and inclusive. And that's hard for me to back up with evidence and science, it's more emotion. And I think that's where we have connected the heart and the mind together. Somewhat accidentally, but still. So, Brendan, um, maple syrup, marmite, and multiculturalism. How can we how can we elevate tolerance and openness as part of the British national identity? And what are, what are the tools you're talking about? Because this is what you're focused on right now. Yeah. I, firstly, to put on the record, I really don't like marmite, uh, but I do like maple syrup, so I might have to yes. move uh, move country at some stage. Um, so, I, I, there's probably very obscure cultural references to the people watching on Facebook Live. Um, so, I, I think that. Um, one, one of the reasons to be optimistic is I do think there is a huge pent-up desire for people to celebrate what binds us together. In the UK, uh, when we have opportunities to do that, whether it's in response to a natural disaster, a birth of a new member of the royal family, the Olympics, the country comes together and celebrates what binds it together. What we're very bad at is finding opportunities to do that. And again, as we were saying earlier, and actually drawing on, on the work of, of Jonathan Haidt, who's here, um, what we, what we tend to do much more on the sort of liberal side of the spectrum is to talk about the difference. We celebrate diversity, and there's definitely a role for that, but it, just as importantly, we need to be talking about the different bits of our culture that bind us together, what it is to be British, what it is to be Canadian. And part of that should absolutely be an openness, a tolerance, and in most of the founding ideals of countries, that is hardwired in. It's true in the case of Canada, true in the case of the US in terms of its uh, nation of immigrants, it's true in the case of the UK, this uh, um, outward looking country, it's true in the case of France and the ideas of the Republic. So there's a lot in that patriotism that can move us in that direction. But I also think um, that we need to think about this uh, from a frame which isn't just economics. I think we make a big mistake if we think that um, solving the, the economy is going to solve this problem. This is as much about culture and identity as it is about economics. I think we have a question here. Can we have a microphone? Thank you. Thank you. This is a fascinating discussion, and, and I certainly uh, uh, um, echo Brendo, Brendan's sentiments about the importance of looking at what binds people together as well. A question for uh, Senator Omidvar. Um, Canada, as, speaking as an American, Canada certainly seems to be more successful in its, in, in its immigration policies, in multiculturalism, and I wonder how much of that is because you have what seems to be an intelligent uh, and, and thoughtful uh, immigration policy, and you have much more high-skilled immigrants, uh, probably much easier to assimilate than in the United States. Do you think it is wise for countries in Europe and North America to be looking at the immigrant flow and deciding th this group, these people, these individuals, yes, we'll take them and they'll be easier to assimilate, but those, no. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, Canada's secret, uh, our recipe for success, is, I think, uh, made up of a number of really powerful ingredients. One, of course, is, our, uh, is, is uh, the lack of boundaries we put around our national identity and how we think of ourselves. But the second is a very carefully managed migration policy. We pick, we select every immigrant, every refugee, every parent, every spouse, everyone who deserves of our, our compassion. So it's a very high touch system. Now our geography lends itself to that. To that. Um, but what we do and so I can't lend you my geography in Europe. But what I can lend you is an aggressive integration uh, strategy. We back up, uh, 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 we back up 
uh, our investment in selection with a highly uh, uh, articulated uh, investment in integration close to $900 million a year. Now, we're a small country, so that's a big figure, and that's only the federal figure. It does not take into account what provincial levels of government will invest in migrant education, immigrant uh, labor market integration. It does not take into account what local uh, governments have done in terms of re-engineering their police forces to look more like the people who they are supposed to police. So this, I think, it's been a trickle down uh, investment that is hard for me to put a figure value to, but I think that is the secret we can export. And if, I, if I can just build on that, I, I think it is, it's definitely partly the who, but it's also the how, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. And that how, um, the, 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 the thing which is most disconcerting to the public about migration is when it feels there isn't process, there isn't order, it's out of control. It's that that, 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 that particularly sort of resonates and scares people. And where you can show process, fairness and order, you tend to have much higher levels of confidence in migration and you also then uh, tend to have much higher levels of confidence in integration. It's such a shame we've run out of time so quickly in, the, in these sessions because we could go on um, for a long time. I'm just going to sum up um, a lot of the comments I've been keeping an eye on on Facebook Live. Um, it's Hunayn Ali um, saying, respect each other's culture. That's my point of view. And I'd say 99% of the comments have, have been around that particular line. For the next couple of minutes, I just want to look ahead five years from now and think about what kind of society we'll be living in whether it's more inclusive, more open, more tolerant, or less so. Maybe Sheikh, perhaps you could give your view of how you view your society and your part of the world. Uh, as far as the future goes, it's difficult now to talk about the future. We say only God knows what's coming, but we can say, the future, it it will it will be good if if these if we can stop these wars. Are these wars going to stop? This is an important question. I think if we spread a culture of peace, especially amongst the youth, things are going to change. But let me say one thing. Jam Jean Monnet was a, he, he, in the 1950s, he was a French intellectual. Uh, I'm not a French speaker, I apologize. Uh, it's, it's not important that you're optimistic or pessimistic. But what's important is determination. And we're determined to spread peace. And so we should be optimistic if we're determined to spread peace. Naam fahimt. Shukran. Brendan, five years' time, how will uh, more in common have um, changed the world? Well, so, so I, I think the, the thing that I'd say is that uh, there is no predetermined path on, on which we are. Um, there are a whole series of forces which are being unleashed, but our reaction to them is as important to that. If you look at elections in the US, it was a few thousand votes in a few states. If you look at the election in Austria, uh, the first um, uh, election there was incredibly close. So it depends on how we organize ourselves and our agency. So if we sit back and wait for the next five years to unfold, I think we have a lot of reasons for pessimism. I think a lot of the trends that we've talked about, whether that's migration, whether that's uh, economic insecurity, whether that's the fourth industrial Re revolution, uh, uh, will create huge challenges. But I also think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. I think we do, the younger people tend to be more progressive and tend to be more uh, tolerant. Um, there is a, uh, as you become more educated and more diverse as a country, you tend to become more tolerant. So there's big demographic uh, things on our side. I also think that we're nowhere near tapping into the strength of the, uh, the, the political center, the, that, that sort of sense of tolerant and open societies. At the moment, uh, the structures are very um, uh, diffuse and very disorganized. What you've got on the populist right is a resurgence 
of organization and activism. And we need to create uh, uh, that equivalent in the political center to reassert that. And if, I, if, if we do that, I'm very confident uh, that in five years' time we can be living in a world where we look back on 2016 not as the beginning of a decline, but as a wake-up call that, that uh, pushed us back together. Senator, you're, you passed your bill in September this year, I believe. It's, it's still before it's the still, Senate. It's still before the Senate. It's still being contested. It's still being contested. Uh, and that's why even in a, in a country like Canada, we cannot take support for multiculturalism for granted. All the indicators tell us in Canada that you know, 30% of Canadians are fully in support of immigration, multiculturalism, diversity, inclusion, that whole basket of public goods. 30% absolutely are not. That's big. And 30% are what we would call conditional multiculturalists, which means people who are inclined to be pro-multicultural but need evidence, need more pushing and nudging. Uh, I'm not in the business of making predictions. If I were, I'd be richer than I am. Uh, but I, I can see some trends. And the trends, I think one of the most hopeful trends in Canada is the slow but steady increase in interracial marriages. Especially in urban Canada, you see couples and, and, and uh, friendships uh, that span races and religion and ethnicity, etc. Uh, but I am also somewhat pessimistic, especially after listening to everything at Davos about the huge displacement that seems to be coming our way through artificial intelligence, where uh, more people will lose their jobs. Um, and it seems to me that no one has the answer to how those who will be displaced by technology, yet again, will be retrained, will be redeployed. Uh, I do worry about inequality fraying at the edges of all our societies, Canada or not. Well, it's been the main theme of this year, this, 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 this year's meeting, and how do we move to a model which is inclusive and sustainable. Thank you very much for joining. I know you all have uh, important meetings to go to. Thank you and, uh, for joining us over and, uh, here. Oh, sir. Kalima. Of course. Hello, uh, Kalima. Naam. I just want to say one word. I want to take this opportunity, this meeting. I want to just call all the people of good intentions that we have to we have to organize we have to join together to fight this hatred and this war i don't say like mark said uh workers of the world unite i say good people of the world unite thank you very much indeed all of you for joining us